shoot. Well, you said she gave off horse girl vibes. A horse girl is like... Someone that likes horses? Yeah, or but it's like an energy, quirky, like bizarre, like unhinged. You just twerking on your horse. You forgot to collect the homework from last night? I don't need friends. I have my horse, okay? I don't need friends because I already have my horse. The horse does all the work. Say these six little words to a horse girl. You want to get stabbed in the eye with a fork. Hi everyone, my name is Tara Mooney and this is the only channel on YouTube where all videos are written and produced by a cow. She couldn't be in the video today because she's actually annoyed that I'm talking about horses instead of cows, so she's trying to teach me a lesson by giving me the cold shoulder. But if you like and subscribe, she might appear in the next video. If you aren't Leah Michelle, you'll know from the title that this video is about horse girls. Yeah, that topic I said I'd talk about months ago. Here I am. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> Unless you don't follow me and my false promises. My name is Tara and I'm Tardy. But this video isn't about me, it's about horse girls. And I want to be clear that I am an outsider looking in. I am not a horse girl myself, at least for now. My only experience riding a horse was on holiday with my parents in Italy when I was 10. and. The horse I was riding was very old and had flies hovering around him. It was actually really sad, but anyway, I digress. And the instructor asked me what my name is, was, and I said, Tara. And she went, that's a weird name. And I went, oh really, what's yours? And she went, Jagmar. And yeah, that experience just didn't encourage me to take it up as a hobby. And I want to add, I'm not here to take the piss that much. I mean, who am I to make fun of someone's obsession over a farmyard animal? Would be a bit rich, wouldn't it? So just to be clear, I'm not trying to stir up any trouble. Get it? Sorry, sorry, I'll stop stalling. Let's get on to the topic. Saddle up! <laughs> According to Google, the horse is a domesticated, one-toed, hoofed mammal. Wow, I'm so glad I checked that before doing this take. Its scientific name is Equus calibus, with a lifespan of 25 to 30 years. And a baby horse is called a foal, and look how cute! So that's what a horse is. What's a horse girl? Here's the possible answers. Is it A? A female horse? Is it B? A centaur type thing but a girl? Is it C? A human girl slash woman who's obsessed with horses? Or is it D? A bisexual woman who won't join you and your boyfriend in bed? I'll give you a minute. You get 40 million dollars if you get this right, so... Ah, no, it is not D. It is in fact C. So yeah, sorry, you don't get the 40 million dollars. I was just about to give you it. I understand why you'd think so, because of the whole bisexual unicorn thing, but a bisexual woman who doesn't want to join you and your boyfriend in bed is not a horse. Your boyfriend is just funky looking. <laughs> but yeah, the answer is actually C, a human woman slash girl who's obsessed with horses. Breathtaking. Except it isn't that straightforward because when one refers to someone as a horse girl, it has some implications. It isn't usually a compliment. In fact, I would even go as far as saying that it's a pejorative. A girl who wears t-shirts with horses on them and tapered denim pants, has really long hair in which they braid and fasten with a scrunchie in the back of their head, will gallop on track during gym class, is only friends with other girls who like horses and will look down on you because you are not a horse. A horse girl is a crazy girl who has an obsession with horses. She doesn't not admit that she is, but she does call herself an equestrian. They usually talk about them all the time and act as if they actually are one. Some horse girls even gallop and eat hair and grass. Careful, she might bite you if you're not looking. Usual names include Emily, 
Madison, Gemma, Sarah, Jessie, Emma. A crazy middle-class white girl who is obsessed with horses. In general, this species of human is exceptionally horny and extremely kinky, so if your girlfriend's a horse girl, watch out because she's definitely going to take the reins in the relationship. Source, a man whose photo on his dating app profile is him holding a fish. But yeah, if you go on Urban Dictionary, Instagram, Twitter, you know, the memes, the definition you'll get won't be so rosy. I have so many questions. How did horse girls become a meme? How is it that when I told people about this video I was writing, you know, even people who aren't on the internet and I said, you, you know, it's about um, those girls in school who are obsessed with horses and they go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. How is it that this is such a phenomenon that is so ubiquitous? People just know it. Well, in order to work all this out, we need to look at the origins of the horse girl. The history of women's relationships with horses. Not in that way. If you make any bestiality jokes in the comments, I will send you to jail. Yes, I do have that power. <laughs> Equestrianism, stemming from equus, which is Latin for horse, covers all horse-related disciplines. Riding, driving, and vaulting, which is like horsey gymnastics. Horses have been and are used for an array of purposes by humans. Working purposes, like police work, boo, and herding animals on a ranch. They are used for transportation, which I don't think I need to explain that one. And of course, they have many recreational purposes for competitive sports like dressage, endurance riding, eventing, reining, show jumping, vaulting, polo, horse racing, and rodeo. And this is a non-exhaustive list. There's also non-competitive recreational riding like fox hunting, trail riding, and hacking. In terms of where we're at today, it really differs from culture to culture. I am not an expert on this topic because I am not a horse. Today, I'm going to zoom in on horses in Western culture. Culture. And I don't mean Western like yee-haw, but I mean Western like the Western world. Otherwise, I'll be here for weeks. But I do want to acknowledge that there's a rich history of equestrianism all over the world. Just to name an example. The Comanche. Tribe native to North America, practiced nomadic horse culture, and have long been considered the masters of horsemanship. Mongolia is known as the land of the horse, so I don't want to in any way undermine the feats in horsemanship and the importance of horses in these cultures. That being said, when one says horse go online, there's a particular image that comes to mind, and that is usually a white, middle class, adolescent girl. I'll expand on this further later. Did you say dragon girls? No, horse. This one's for dragon girls. The girls from middle school who flew into class blowing flames on their enemies. They had dragon figurines and posters all over their rooms, but most of them didn't even ride dragons cringe. But if you were one of those girls, have I got the game for you? Or even if you weren't one of those girls, I think you'll like this game. And that is Dragon City, who is the sponsor of today's video. Dragon City is a free mobile game where you get to create your own dragon empire by collecting, hatching, and evolving more than a thousand unique dragons, including dragons of your favorite YouTubers. You can construct and customize your dream city with magical habitats, buildings, and decor. You get to join a lively community of players and trade dragons and even form alliances to unlock exclusive rewards. You'll engage in battles with other dragon masters to prove your dragon strength and then dominate the leaderboard. It's like the Hunger Games, but no one dies at the end. This game has everything, aesthetic graphics, magical powers, cute and scary dragons, and challenging events and quests like the Wizard's Hollow. This game doesn't get boring and it's free. So download Dragon City by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code. And this will get you a special bundle with 15,000 food, 30,000 gold, plus 
the very rare black metal dragon. All of this to get you started. And when you start playing this game, you'll realize what a good gift this is. Make sure to check them out if you're interested because it really helps out the channel. And thank you so much to Dragon City for sponsoring. Now, fly away dragons. Let's gallop back over to horse girls. Now let's look at the intersection between women's rights and horse riding. Up until the early 20th century, women were mostly expected to ride side saddle as opposed to astride, like straddling. So side versus astride. Traditionally before women were allowed to ride side saddle on their own, they would ride behind a male counterpart, sitting on a cushion and most importantly, keeping their legs together. Why? Because modesty, hymens, chastity. The expectation for women to ride side saddle is said to trace back to 1382. Princess Anne of Bohemia rode side saddle across Europe on her way to marry King Richard II and riding side saddle was the way to protect her virginity. To straddle a horse was seen as vulgar. The horse girl discrimination goes way back. Though there were some girl boss rebels like Marie Antoinette and Catherine the Great who still chose to ride astride, slay, nay. Now, there were women who made careers out of horse riding even when they could still only ride side saddle. A fun one being in post-revolution France, the the circus allowed women to participate in aristocratic military traditions like dressage, making fancy footwork and trick riding carnivalesque entertainment. In 1840, there were even more female riders than male riders, and at the turn of the 20th century, horsewomanship enabled some women to achieve financial independence. Some écrières came from working class backgrounds and others, you know, were brought up comfortably but joined the circus as a way to gain financial independence after a divorce or their fathers went broke. With all that being said, riding a horse astride was still prohibitive for women until 1930 in France. In the early 20th century, it became more socially acceptable for women to ride astride, as long as if they were wearing split skirts or breeches. And the women's suffrage movement deserves credit for this, as they saw riding side saddle as a symbol of male domination. The American suffragist Inez Milholland led 8,000 people in a Washington protest, riding astride in a flowing white cape. And something that's also interesting is the impact of the Second World War on equestrian sports. With, you know, men dying in the war, it led to more space being available in equestrian sports. So they were more open to accepting women in those spaces to fill the void. It is worth noting that these sports, much like now, were very much dominated by the wealthy and wealthy women had a bit more freedom than the rest of women, right? They were more able to bend the rules and it had been acceptable for a while for them to ride horses recreationally. So gradually they started to infiltrate more masculine disciplines of horsemanship, like official competition. In 1952, women were allowed to compete in Olympic equestrian competition. 32 years before they were allowed to compete in cycling on an Olympic level. And today, men and women compete on equal terms, so there aren't gendered categories. By the way, I'm coming down with a cold, so apologies, I sound very bunged up, but maybe it's endearing. Anyway, once riding astride was allowed, riding side saddle became passe. That being said, riding side saddle has had a revival, and some call this the Lady Mary effect, like Lady Mary in Downton Abbey, who rides side saddle in the show. I have an awkward anecdote about this actress, uh, Michelle Doherty, I believe her name is. I was watching Anatomy of a Scandal and I was thirsting over her and I just posted it on my stories. And then my friend Jordan of Jordan Theresa responded like, babe, that's you. There are current side saddle riding groups in the UK and I have to say their names. We've got the Flying Foxes and my favourite, A Bit On The Side. I mean, come on, we gotta give it to the girls. Currently, the British side saddle high jump record is by Michaela Bowling at six foot three inches. Now that horses have mostly been replaced in terms of transportation, and the military, though the police do ride them a lot in the UK, so 
freedom. But yeah, for the most part, in places like the UK, they have become mostly associated with recreational riding. And over time, horse riding has become feminized in many places. A lot of my sources focused on France, the UK, and of course the US, because the majority of my audience are the US. There are exceptions to this, as there's places with more masculine traditions surrounding horse riding. So think rodeo and ranch work, Canada's Mounties, Mongolia's herdsmen, Spanish bullfighting traditions, boo. But they don't get called horse boys. I do think also it's not just the gender thing. Uh, these disciplines don't get memed on in the same way because in these cultures, horses, they're a big part of society. Unlike the UK, most people don't ride horses because they don't need to. So if you do ride horses, you stick out more. So this is why I would argue that the concept of a horse girl has taken off in somewhere like the UK. 74% of the horse riding population in the UK are women. French horse riding counts today 700,000 licensed riders, of which 80% are women. A study conducted a few years ago has highlighted the typical profile of the rider in France, a girl under 16 years old. It is worth noting that there are higher numbers of men in professional competition and a much higher percentage of women in amateur recreational riding. So there's a paradox here. In a discipline, sport, that is seen as feminine and womanly, women are still underrepresented in high level competition. Equestrianism is the only Olympic discipline to allow men and women to compete at an equal level in the same events on equal terms. But gender equalities in the broader world still exist. French Olympic show jumper Penelope Leprevos has said, it has nothing to do with competence. Women are really on equal terms with men because the 700 kilogram athlete who jumps over bars is not the rider, but the horse. What makes the difference is that the life of a competition rider implies leaving home every week from Wednesday to Sunday evening, a rhythm hardly compatible with a woman's life. The women can't have it all conundrum still exists in the horsey world. So that's a bummer. So that's where we're at. If you need a summary because you skipped the chapter, for ages women could only ride side saddles so they wouldn't become wretched whores. But now they can straddle horses because they can vote and the two things are connected, right? You can trust someone to vote, you can trust them to straddle a horse. What could go wrong? Well, they could become horse girls. <laughs> I jest. Horse girls aren't hurting anybody. Or are they? What if I said cowgirls were better? You can't ride a cow because, you know, they'd freak out, but you can hire them to edit your videos for you. Truth. Don't ask me to prove it. <laughs> with the integration of real human women with horses... That was a weird way of phrasing it. Am I going to edit it out? No, I'm flawed. I'm goofy. I'm just like you. With the growing culture of women enjoying horse riding and an interest in horses in general, came the portrayal of this connection in literature, film, media. The fictional horse girl. And what's fun about this is you see life imitating art. There are stories about horse girls based on real life people, but many horse girls credit the horse girl canon for igniting their passion for horses and becoming horse girls in their real lives. It's like the chicken or egg situation, capiche? The horse girl canon is vast. So vast, one could do a master's degree on it. I mean, not me, because I don't have the attention span for that, but someone much more dedicated than I could. Shout out to this article on Polygon that thoroughly lays out the horse girl canon, including books, films, toys, board games, online games. They do not miss a beat. They explain the horse girl story formula and 
I love women in STEM. What makes something part of the horse girl canon? Not all horse girl stories are about or for girls, for one. Among these are Black Beauty by Anna Sewell and much of Margaret Henry's extensive bibliography. Mary O'Hara's My Friend Flicker and Beauty by Bill Wallace are both about horse boys, but they are still part of the horse girl canon. What they have in common is that they fed the same hunger, a desire for stories about these huge huge magical speed machines, and more often than not, the special kids that befriend them. So true. You don't have to be a girl to be a horse girl. Statistically, you know, odds are you are a girl if you're a horse girl, but not necessarily. It's a bit like the Karen meme, and sorry horse girls to compare you to Karens, but bear with. You know how we call male Karens male Karens, and some people try to make them Kevins, but it didn't quite catch on. It's because Karen Karen is an energy, a vibe, much like the horse girl. It's an aura, you know? That being said, the fact that it's girls who tend to be into horses cannot be underestimated in importance, but we'll get into this later when we get to the lovely misogyny part. Woo! <laughs> now, let me give you an outline of the canon. So, it turns out there's a lot of horse literature. You can open a whole bookshop of just horsey books. I'm not kidding, I should do that. I'll do that right when I'm done with this video. New business venture, mindset, grindset, always be grinding. Again, I need to give massive credit to this article. Thank you, lovely. You. you don't know? Oh, you're deaf. Okay, thank you. Love you. She's deaf, you bitch. Here's some of the literary horsey classics. Black Beauty, His Grooms and Companions, The Autobiography of a Horse. This is a prolific horse girl book, but it wasn't actually written for children. It is a memoir told from the perspective of an English working horse, and it's been praised as the most influential anti-animal cruelty novel of all time. We've got Margaret Henry's 59 books about horses and other animals, but we're talking about horses today. Pigs move. Walter Farley's Black Stallion series with 20 books and the story focuses on a horse boy. We love gender equality. Boys don't get enough representation in media and I've always said this. The Saddle Club series that follows three besties who all attend riding lessons together. These 100 plus books are considered the relatable horse girl stories. And there's Pony Pals. This is like the same thing but for younger readers. And of course we've got the movies. Here's a quick explanation of the quintessential horse girl movie. A really common trope is the horse that can't be controlled by any human but eventually comes to love and trust the main character. A lot of these stories also feature a sort of mean girl character as an antagonist. This character is almost always incredibly rich and she always treats her horses badly and or isn't actually a good rider. She wins all the competitions because her parents can afford to buy her fancy horses and pay for good trainers. But she isn't a real horse girl. Did I mention that she's pretty and vain? The main character on the other hand can barely afford her horse, doesn't care about her appearance, and isn't the flashiest rider. What she does have going for her though is that she actually cares about her horses. She doesn't need money or high quality training. She's able to take a badly behaved and barely trained horse and turn it into a champion. She is, to put it simply, not like other girls. So for the movies of course we've got Black Beauty, many iterations, many versions, film versions have been made about this. Uh, my friend Flicker, was also adapted into a film. Again, it's about a horse boy. He's one of the girls. Love it. National Velvet, also based on a novel, a 1935 novel by Enid Bagnold. Uh, it's the story of Velvet Brown, who wins a horse in an auction, trains him to be a steeplechase champion, and disguises herself as a boy so she can race herself. That's very gender of her. We're all born naked and the rest is drag. The Black Stallion, which apparently contains some of the best horse acting ever captured on screen. <laughs> The horse put its whole horse sissy into the role. <laughs> the last unicorn. I won't be talking about unicorns in great detail in this video, but I do agree that there's a crossover between unicorns and horse girl 
content. They're cousins. In mythology, horses can only be uh, seen and ridden by virgins. Who knew animals could slut shame? Nay. I also want to mention a Disney Channel original movie, so a bit of an obscure reference. I'm into the indie stuff, <laughs> but it's called Ready to Run. It's about a young Mexican-American teenager who's an aspiring jockey. So it's set in the backdrop of a boy-dominated race course, as well as very white. Her dad dies in a horse accident, but she still loves horses. She's a bigger person than me. Oh, and I buried the lead. She can speak to horses. There are, of course, dozens more examples, but I wanted to just give you an overview of the range of stories where horses are the driving force of the plot and the main characters. So it's no surprise that kids who have never met or interacted with horses can still develop an obsession with horses after consuming this media. And then there's toys. I got some of my own back here. They never say that I don't commit to the bit. When we get to toys, this is where the heavy-handed gendered marketing comes in. My little pony, my little pony, come and brush her hair. My little pony, heavily marketed towards girls. A day at the salon with a pony's touch. My And of course there's briar horses. Playing with horsey dolls has therefore become known as sort of girly toys. And this leans into the gender stereotype that women naturally align with soft skills and nurturing. And I can't forget to mention that there are people in the horse world who believe that women are naturally better at communicating with horses. So that's kind of wild. Whereas young boys, you know, they're marketed trucks and swords. You know the drill. And, you know, this contributes to presumptions that limit both boys and girls. So it's no wonder that young boys are less likely to take up horse riding lessons than young girls. So an obsession with horses has become strongly associated with young girls. And if girls like it, it's silly. Because girls are silly. Particularly preteen girls. Think of that girl in middle school. She owns figurine horses, has horse posters all over her walls, plays star stables online, wears her hair in French braids, and canters into class. And then the icing on top of the cake? She doesn't even ride horses. That's right, you don't even need to ride horses to be a horse girl. The most horsiest of horse girl things you can do is not ride horses but instead fantasize about riding horses. Play with horse figurines and know everything there is to know about horse breeds. The irony of it all is that horse loving kids are more united by stories about horses than actual horses. Oh! Yikes. Yeah. We gotta get this girl to horse camp. Pronto. From my hours and hours hours of exposure to horse girl media and posts, I've come to realise that being a horse girl is less about riding horses than it is about channeling horse girl energy. If you ask outsiders, they would define horse girl energy as a you know it when you see it phenomenon. It describes an outcast with a niche interest. Someone who's blissfully clueless. Swifties ooze horse girl energy. People who claim their eyes change colour with their mood give off the same energy as horse girls. Uh oh, this is about me. The sun has come out and I'm a green eyed girly so I'm about to be insufferable. All horse girls are American girl doll girls but not all American girl doll girls are horse girls. Like squares and rectangles. Nevertheless, a horse girl does actually describe a girl who's obsessed with horses because da -doy. She has French braids, horse decor, isn't the most fashionable. I think this starter pack does a pretty good job. Oh, and this one. Their profile picture on Facebook is them with a horse. Oh, and they post very chuggy memes. If they don't ride horses, they will compensate for it by incessantly talking about horses. And you know what? Good for her. Now, 
If you ask equestrians, as in people who ride horses, they make sure to separate themselves from the nerdy horse girls. There's a lot of debate around the definition of a horse girl, which I hope you've come to realise from watching this. Some would argue that not all equestrians are horse girls, and as we've come to realise, not all horse girls are equestrians. Some would argue <laughs> that an equestrian is a type of horse girl. Some would point out the horse girl, Adelaide, to equestrian pipeline. Now, if you ask me, I would say that in order to be an equestrian, you've got to at least be somewhere on the horse girl spectrum. Just because riding horses and looking after horses, even if you don't own your own and you just hire one, requires a lot of care and time and energy. So you've got to at least care about horses a fair bit. And to ride horses regularly, you know, it's physically exhausting and it's a skill that takes a while to hone. For the most part, it's not a casual hobby. You've got to be at least slightly slightly horse girlish to be an equestrian. But that's just if you ask me. I'm neither an equestrian nor a horse girl, so what the hell do I know? Some say that horse girls, you know, the adolescents who are obsessed with horses, tend to grow out of it. Equestrians, on the other hand, pursue horse riding and dedicate their lives to it. Apparently. So they say. But they really want you to know that they're not like other horse girls. Like everyone finds the horse girl weird in school, but lucky for me there was like four of them. Mm. So I was like one of the best ones really so, so did you like turn up to school in like boots and that no never oh, okay. never like but one girl went to the stables in the morning before school she always stank a shit that could never be me who are horse girls biggest haters equestrians no not really it's men who say they won't date horse girls because they're crazy <laughs> imagine being obsessed with horses when you could be obsessed with cars they go vroom vroom <laughs> But there are equestrians who make content mocking horse girls in order to separate themselves from them. They don't want to carry the stigma of horse girls. Horse girls are dorky and awkward, whereas equestrians are sexy and powerful. They're not like other horse girls. I found an article that has some excellent points about the equestrian tendency to lean into the I'm not like other girls trope. But I do want to quickly poke a little fun at one line in the article before I praise them. No, horses don't do all the work. No, it's not the same as racing. Yes, we are a team. It's all about partnership. But is Hayley Bieber really the best choice to represent all of us under the banner of horse girl cool? <laughs> it's giving the same energy as when Kendall Jenner was outmodeled by a horse. Who served more, Kendall Jenner or this horse? No, Rover, you do not get to to take all the credit. Move your long ass face and let me share the glory. Cheating at horse racing by giving the horse an earpiece where I can tell it what to do next. Run faster. I'm kidding. Horse riding is a real sport and it's very difficult. I'm just joshing. Back to the article. CB Tay did a great job. I'm sorry for comparing you to Kendall Jenner. They point out how the I'm not like other girls trope is a big part of horse girl culture. In that equestrians claim claim to be not like other girls, but also not like other horse girls. So it's a two in one, buy one, get one free. Most of the memes on horse girl pages are about how equestrians spend all their money on their horses and nothing on themselves. Girls who wear makeup, put effort into their appearance, or spend money on luxuries are derided as not real horse girls. This definitely plays into that mean girl trope that is so popular popular in the horse girl stories. I think this is also where you get a lot of the memes about being dirty or smelling like a horse. From an outside perspective, yes, it seems really weird that anyone would want a t-shirt proclaiming that they smell like a farm animal, but a lot of horse girls pride themselves on not caring what other people think. You see this in horse girl movies a lot, and even in academic explorations of the phenomenon. While some girls had fantasies of thinness and boys who will protect and keep men who will validate their existence. I had fantasies of horses. I dreamed of being with horses, raising horses, training horses, riding horses, and being myself 
horse. At school, when my body was alone and merely small girl, I was silent. On my horse, snip away. I became huge and powerful and beautiful. On my horse, I mattered in both senses of that word. And this is the classic conundrum of the I'm not like other girls phenomenon. On the one hand, you have a girl or woman denigrating a typically girly or feminine interest, so they're throwing other women under the bus, but on the other hand, you do have to sympathise with why they're doing that. It's clear that the writer felt like an outcast growing up and oppressed by beauty standards and horses gave them moments of freedom from that. Horse girls are girls who, to some perhaps small extent, resist mainstream culture's death grip of frail girls, skinny body, makeup and beauty demands. Horsey girls find a way to find something else. This is where you lost me. I find it very hard to believe that fat phobia doesn't exist in the horsey world. And queer non-white horse girls can attest to this, which I'll get into in more detail later. The typical horse girl is seen as very hetero and white and, you know, straight sized But in fairness to this writer, I can see how embracing being dirty and rugged and powerful can feel liberating. And that's a sentiment I came across a lot in my research. Women and girls find horse riding emphatically empowering. So even though there's a fair bit of internalised misogyny going on here, like everywhere, I feel inclined to give equestrians some grace. They likely were mocked at school, and I understand the impulse to defend their passion. Horses take so much work and require a lot more physical labour than looking after a dog or a cat or any other pet, unless you have a pet lion, which I really hope you don't. I notice when asking people who've owned horses whether they consider their horses pets, they said no. They consider them companions or projects. A and yeah, I guess you are dedicating 20 plus years of your life to them. But don't just take it from me. When trying to find out what a horse girl truly is, surely I should ask one myself. Get perspective directly from the horse's mouth. Come on, come on, that was good. You know you love it. Round of applause for me. So this is my friend Audrey. She made the artwork for my channel banner and the podcast, which is now on hiatus, but that's neither here nor there. And she is a self-proclaimed horse girl. And she has a horse called Mason. Let's hear from Audrey about horse stuff. I started recording because I wanted her to appear in the video. <laughs> Here she is! Bye, Pete! So, you had some fun horse facts to share? Mm, horses have really small brains. <laughs> their whole head is mostly like air and teeth <laughs> and tongue. Really? And Bless. their teeth are also like always growing. So, this is why like some of the things pe people think horses are weird. It's because they are. And I will buy anything that has horses on it. Like, I'm one of those yeah. people. <laughs> Speaking of, show us, show us your fit today. Show us your horse fit. Oh, yeah. I'm just wearing um, this horse vest. Cute. I thrifted it, but I think it's from Lisa Says Ga. And I have a tattoo mm. of my horse as well. There oh. he is. I know I usually do this at the end, but let's do it now. The subscription pet shelter today is, of course, Mason. Mason is a 22-year-old quarter horse that Audrey has had since she was a seven-year-old. Although he spent most of his life as a hunter-jumper, he is now enjoying his semi-retirement. He is chronically lazy, will sleep just about anywhere, and enjoys nothing more than eating. His favourite food is peppermints, and he hates black construction tubes. Oh, what a good boy. Boy. You know, training a horse is an art. You have to work with the animal, bending its will until it knows you're its master, taking all the fight out of it until it truly is broken. Um, that's how you're gonna feel when I'm through with you. When I saw videos of equestrians comparing themselves to horse girls in a superior way, it really didn't sit right with me. And 
It isn't just because of the internalised misogyny and the ageism of making fun of teenage girls when you're a grown adult, but also the elitism. There are many people, horse girls, who adore horses and would love to ride them, but they can't afford it. It just simply isn't accessible to them. The preteen girl with horses all over her wall, you know, might not be able to afford to ride horses, but it doesn't mean she loves horses any less. And I can't ignore the fact that the term horse girl is associated with whiteness, wealth, and often rural conservatism. And in fairness, there are horse girls who acknowledge this issue and try to break down these barriers. However, there are some who get very defensive about it. You must have a rich daddy. Yes, because it's completely implausible that a woman of any age could afford a horse on her own, right? Excuse me while I punch you in the face. You only need to ask a horse girl of colour to unveil the gatekeeping in the horse girl world. Lithe teenage girls with impossible French braids who as adult women will tell men they're not like other girls. If you were to lean close and breathe deep, she would smell like heterosexuality, independence, whiteness, femininity, fat, though I wasn't, not really yet, Queer? I didn't know I was, but maybe they knew? Latinx? Despite a robust, non-white tradition of horse riding that dates back centuries, we think of horseback riding as being necessarily the sport of the wealthy, and, by extension, whiteness. Equestrian sports are some of the most expensive to get into. Something that a lot of people don't know, this is kind of like rich horse person culture, but in <laughs> Florida, every year, Florida is like huge horse country, mm -hmm. um, like like really bougie, rich Engl English riding horse country. And every year they hold, hold this huge event called the Winter Equestrian Festival. And for months, like everybody, especially people from the cold uh, climate. So like up here in New England, people will take all of their horses down to Florida for like a few months and they'll go and live there for a few months and just like show for months. It's like something so crazy. The barn, Mason was um, kind of leased out as a lesson horse for like a year uh, while I was in college to this very fancy barn. Uh, like the board is like $4,000 a month. They have grooms that would like brush and tack your horse up for you. They would exercise your horse for you, everything. Like people would come down from, or come up from New York City and they would just call and be like, tack up my horse. Like I'm gonna come at three o'clock. Like someone have him ready. In the winter, it would be practically empty because they took all of their horses down to Florida. And all the kids who are there are doing like online, they either have like tutors or they're doing online school, things like that. Like it's really, it's shockingly common for people to go all the way down to Florida for months at a time every year. Yeah, like I don't even, like there's so many things that like rich people do that I can't even fathom. <laughs> it's it's really like an insane level of wealth. I also grew up near this barn called Old Salem Farm and it was like beautiful like stone barns and they would have a huge show every year. That's, that's where they did like some of the Grand Prix and like the Olympic riders would come and ride. And like they're, they're, those horses, that they bring to the Olympics, those are like half a million dollar horses. And I'd like to give a cultural perspective from someone who's British. Tuesday. <laughs> I would argue that we associate horse girls with wealth even more than in the US because we don't have that country boy yee-haw stuff. Ranches and all that malarkey. If you ride horses here, it's assumed that you live in the country, live in a big country house and shop at Waitrose. And I just want to 100% clear up right now that I'm not a Tory. Here, historically, they're the preserve of the at least comfortably well-off, see Polo, Ascot, and of those who have access to the countryside. The former, at least, is probably a bit less true of the US. For this reason, British horse girls feel less like they possess a specific energy per se, unless telling the teacher is a specific energy. And Mr. Windex, you forgot to collect the homework from last night. And it's more that they share a general overarching mode of existence. But to say that, you know, all horse girls are exclusionary and rich, prissy mean girls. The I've ever met that does horse riding is a bitch. Like, sorry, Harriet, don't attack me, but they're bitches. People think I'm a bitch because of you. Oh, glue factory, mate. 
I'm sorry. Would be unfair. Many people who are into horse riding will exchange labour for free horse riding lessons or access to horses, you know, mucking stables, that kind of thing. And there are horse girls who are actively working hard to make the space more accessible. And as much as I like to rag on TikTok as a commentary YouTuber, it has been such a useful platform for less represented voices in the horse girl world to get their voices out there. And let's not forget that there are critically important outreach programs, you know, where horse riding is utilized as a form of therapy for people with mental or physical health issues and disabilities and the chronically ill. So let's not just paint all of it with one broad brush. And let's look into why some people are a little too invested in mocking horse girls. Dude, what is up with like the horse thing, man? Like I'm scared, like I'm petrified of like horse girls and stuff like that, man. Horse girls are just It's rough. just another, just I don't rough. think they're rough. I just think they're crazy. They're I just feel just... like if you rub your hand like across their skin, it'd be rough. <laughs> It's the biggest ick. Horse girl, innit? <laughs> oh, yeah. We've talked about internalized misogyny, but what about regular schmegular bog standard misogyny? Original flavored. I've noticed a real double standard here. I know I goofed on horse girls getting aggy about this earlier, but it is interesting that there are people trying to denigrate it as a sport, but will accept that race car driving is a sport. You know, and do we goof on footy lads the same, rugby lads, American football blah 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 much like the mockery of one direction fans twilight girlies it does just seem that people are embracing an opportunity to mock young girls for being passionate about something girls are silly therefore anything girls like is silly girls like horses resulting in liking horses being silly. For me personally, and for so many girls, shame is a dominant emotion. That's how our culture trains girls to feel. Ashamed of their bodies, their desires, their sexuality, their origins, their upbringing. Ashamed to be too loud or too quiet or to say the wrong thing. Even the term horse girl is meant to make its subject feel ashamed. Not so much for liking horses really but for being a girl it's dumb because you are a girl meanwhile boys who like horses get to be cowboys masculine icons of america i would go a step further and argue that young boys are discouraged from getting into horse riding in the first place because it's become so feminized and therefore goofed on so much. That being said, those who do get into it, men and boys, a high proportion of them end up doing it professionally. Whereas the majority of amateur and recreational riding is carried out by girls and women. For whatever reason, misogyny plus animals equals extra concentrated misogyny. I don't know what it is, but people really don't like animal obsessed women. Like cat ladies, I mean, they're not hurting anyone. If I were to hazard a guess, I guess it's because animal care and conservation is associated with femininity, caring about the planet even. Women are much more likely to be involved in animal protection and animal advocacy, much more likely to be vegetarian, more likely to hoard animals, and much less likely to hunt or engage in direct animal abuse. They're more likely to hoard animals <laughs> Who had more tigers in Tiger King? Was it Carol Baskin or uh, Joe Exotic? Actually, I'm not gonna look that up because that's depressing. As a result of this mockery and stigma, we get sexualization. I'm sure virtually all horsewomen can attest to the fact that the whole ride me like you ride your horse was a frequent pickup line used on us. On top of this, the sexual remarks also turned to insults. At least I don't fuck horses and so on and so forth. I spend pretty equal time with my horses as I do with my dog and cat, yet I've never had a man question my love for my dog and turn it into something sexual. The hypersexualization of women who ride horses predominantly comes from men, but in turn, these insults and demeaning remarks are used by women who think it's something that will give them an edge in an argument. I've observed that alongside sexualization, there are men who 
describe horse girls as crazy and therefore undateable. You know, they're too high maintenance. And listen, we've seen today that there are girls who are very obsessed with their horses and it can be a bit goofy. And you know, date who you want to date. Don't force yourself to date someone you don't want to date, you know. For me, a Potterhead, you know, that's a litmus test, even before JK Rowling became Queen Turf. That being said, I wonder if it goes deeper than that. Now, bear with me, but I wonder if there's an element of jealousy. Like, if you date a horse girl, especially one who owns their own horse, you know that a huge chunk of her time and income will go to looking after that horse, because they're very high maintenance. And I don't even think it would be necessarily unjustified to consider this when making a decision whether to date someone, because, you know, you have to make sacrifices when you own a pet, let alone a horse. It is, it is really fucking expensive. It's ridiculously expensive. I pay $1,100 every month in board, 280 every six weeks for his shoes, and then $120 a month in supplements and $125 for the chiropractor. The vet, it's at least $100 to get them to come out to see your horse and then they do whatever they need to do. It's something that you have to yeah. sacrifice your whole life for pretty much. You know, it makes moving more difficult. Any disposable income will go to the horse unless you have family wealth. Many women see time with the horse as me time and so the horse's high needs actually give them a way to prioritise their own needs over and above the needs of the partner, children or work lives. It was common to hear women say the horse comes first before anything else. In practice, this meant women had grounds to carve out time and money for their own domain of activities. They seemed to be taking ownership over their capacity to care and applying it to a realm that they had chosen and where they had authority over who, when and how they would offer their devotion. This fascinated me because I genuinely think this is where a lot of the animosity towards people who dedicate a lot of time and energy to their animals comes from. I imagine a more traditional man would take issue with this. And I'm not saying it doesn't go both ways. I've met hetero couples where the woman would be jealous of the man's dedication to his pet dog. And I know I'm biased because I have these two little guys. I think there's no point in having an animal unless you're gonna give them 110%. And if I met someone with a pet who didn't, that would be a red flag. But that is my opinion. Allegedly, that is my opinion. I took up shifts at the barn I had my boyfriend came and did shifts at the barn with me to like work the board down. Um, like you kind of just do what you have to. And I'm like, even if I couldn't ride this horse, it wouldn't matter. I'd still pay this amount of money for him. It's, it's with older horses, especially like it's not, it's not a great world out there for older horses. Most people don't see them as pets. They see them as working animals. So once a horse has gotten past the age of being able to regularly work, or in a lot of cases, like regularly show, they don't really have as much of a use. And then it is literally just a money pit. And in the saying it in the nicest way possible, I love my money pit, but it's very challenging to keep a senior horse. And a lot of people will retire them like for my, in my area for example like you retire them to a farm down south where it's cheaper i my mentality going into it even though i'm spending like the majority of my income on him is that he has given me his whole life and it's like the least i can do for the rest of his years to keep him happy and comfortable and, and with me. Fortunately, because of the internet allowing for subcultures to thrive and often grow into beasts of their own, and the discourse around internalized misogyny becoming more mainstream, it seems that horse girls and, you know, girls with other interests are becoming less ashamed and publicly embracing these passions. <laughs> The horse girls are fighting back and I'm an ally. 
the term horse girl is used dismissively by outsiders, but there are many horse girls who are embracing the label loud and proud. And they're not even getting defensive about it. They're just like, yeah, it's a bit weird, but so what? Why? Because of the benefits. The benefits of horse riding outweigh the downsides of being goofed on. This platonic horse represents a refusal to be tamed, an inherent beauty, and a superhuman strength. And anyone who proves themselves worthy of a horse's trust takes on those traits by proxy. It's a power fantasy that strains against the reins of a culture that tells young people that they can be strong and independent, or they can be beautiful. And it's no surprise that when celebrities and it girls endorse something, Thing, it becomes cool. Like I remember once when I was walking Siggy along and these girls were like, oh, it's a Kylie Jenner dog. And I looked down and I was like, Siggy had fillers? Anyway, Bella Hadid has shared her love of horses and Hayley Bieber was described as the epitome of horse girl cool in a Victoria's Secret campaign. Chanel used the horse girl aesthetic in its display at Haute Couture Week in Paris in 2022. And just the general horsey aesthetic becoming fashion, you know, much like sportswear. Do I think these things will encourage more people to get into horse riding? I don't know. Probably. Even if it's just a little bit. No. No, 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 piss off. But they will give horse girls a bit more street cred so people don't automatically assume they're weirdos. But then again, what's wrong with being a weirdo? Being an adult woman who unapologetically loves horses, Taylor Swift, Twilight, it's like writing a love letter to your younger self. When you were a teen, you might have had to like these things in secret in fear of being mocked and ostracized, or even stopped yourself from starting to explore these interests because of internalized misogyny. But the beauty of being an adult is that you have so much more agency over your social life. You can cut people out who shame you for liking the things you like. Because honestly, life is too bloody short. Can I get an amen? With regards to horse girl visibility, I think it's less about getting approval from the general public than it is about opening up the space to more people. Thanks to TikTok, we see adults being encouraged to take up horse riding, whether it's, you know, reigniting an interest from their childhood or for the first time in their lives. There's now podcasts earnestly representing horse girls. There's a magazine I found called Calling All Horse Girls, which promotes what I call an anti-gatekeeping of the horse girl world. I named the company Calling All Horse Girls because it is exactly what we are doing, calling all horse girls and saying, hey, you belong here. Using the term horse girl was important to me because in the past it has had such a narrow stereotype definition, when in reality horse girls are a robust, strong and empowering group of people who happen to be horse lovers. They reclaim what it means to be a horse girl. It's cool, beautiful and empowering and brings community rather than making you more isolated. And that's just something very beautiful about that. And this goes to show that niche communities thrive when they actively try to work against gatekeeping. Being a horse girl is what you make of it. You know what? I am a horse girl now. I may not ride horses in the traditional sense. I do what they call vegan horse riding. My goal is to become an Olympic hobby horse rider by my 30th birthday. I'll be the horsiest horse girl who has ever lived. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this video. It has taken a long time for me to work on. But I really appreciate you watching till the end. Thank you to Audrey for your time and your insight. Thank you to all the sources and thank you to all the horse girls. And of course, thank you to Dragon City for sponsoring this video. To play Dragon City, click the link in the description or scan my QR code. You'll get 15,000 free food, 30,000 free free gold and the very rare black metal dragon. And last but definitely not least, thank you to the patrons for keeping this channel alive.